you have to, first of all, forgive the accent. Uh, secondly, I'm fighting a bit of a cold, so bear with me. Um, first of all, thanks for the, uh, for the invitation to come. It's a, real, it's a real honor to be asked. This is also my first time in Scotland, and so it's a pleasure to be here. I uh, was in Bath yesterday at the university uh, giving a talk for the, uh, for the web uh, leaders and the, uh, the, their IT teams from around the United Kingdom, and uh, they too reminded me that uh, my accent was a bit off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm uh, going to talk about, uh, about some of the big trends uh, that we're seeing and hope mostly to be short and to get to a conversation, and I look forward to spending the rest of the day with you. Uh, let me first say that I'm a, a huge fan of, of JISC and of CDIS, and I've been a student of their work now for, uh, for almost a decade. I was, I've been things like director of academic technology and director of e-learning for various universities and states, and most recently in community and technical colleges uh, in the state of Washington, where we had approximately 500,000 students in 30 colleges. And we were involved in, in both uh, a significant amount of online learning uh, but also open educational resources, and I'll talk a bit about that. So I feel very much at home with my, with my colleagues from JISC. Uh, of course, all of these slides are under an open license, and, uh, and Lorna has them and will make them available. I always like to start with uh, the big idea of why we're here and, and what we're talking about. And fundamentally, in education, we're talking about people having uh, the right, and in fact, a human right, uh, to an education. Uh, and if you look at uh, the United Nations uh, Bill of Human Rights, you'll see that uh, recently they've actually added the right to an education, which is somewhat interesting. They've not uh, had this in the past. And, uh, and this is really because the capabilities that we have today and have had for roughly the last 10 years have changed significantly. And the main reason that we're talking about and having a uh, serious conversation about making sure that everybody on the planet has access to educational resources and uh, a quality education is because what we produce today and what we have produced for approximately a decade in education is digital resources. So what we produce in video, audio, slide decks, uh, curriculum, textbooks, uh, yes, we may still use printed materials, but there are digital versions of those things. And uh, as we'll talk today, digital things have unique characteristics, mainly that you can store them for almost zero uh, cost, you can distribute them for almost zero cost, and you can replicate them. So I can, we can make a million or a billion copies of this slide deck, uh, store it, distribute it for almost nothing. And that's different. Uh, think about uh, how educational resources uh, have been distributed throughout human history, how they've been controlled uh, first in the monasteries, and, and you can go down the timeline. Um, it, it's a very different world that we live in today, and yet our structures in how we think about education, how we fund education, uh, who gets access to education is very much bound up in old models of thinking around distribution and storage of knowledge. And it need not be that way anymore. So I, I'm, uh, if I accomplish one thing today, I hope to break uh, old models uh, a bit more and get us thinking a little bit more creatively about how we can uh, share learning resources. <clears throat> why is this important? Why, uh, why have we dedicated our careers to education? Uh, fundamentally because we believe that an education is a good thing. We believe it's a good thing for individuals, for families, for societies uh, to have an educated citizenry. And if you look at the amount of money that governments uh, spend around the world, they spend roughly 5% of their GDP uh, on education investments, uh, and so the question, who's here from government? Okay, so the questions that governments are asking around the world, and we'll be specific in a moment, is how can we maximize the public's dollar in the education investments that we make? Uh, and I would argue that fundamentally right now we're doing a, a relatively poor job at that because our investments are based on old models and not models that take advantage of the affordances of digital things and of open licensing. So we'll talk about both. So not only do we, uh, John Daniel was mentioned a minute ago, which was, uh, which was uh, fun because here's a slide. Um, not only do we have this opportunity, but there's tremendous demand for a higher education and it's increasing because more and more people around the world sort of are getting it that if you want to 
uh, have a good life and you want to be recession proof and you want to have more money and, and have a better lifestyle and do well by your family that you need to have a higher education. It's simply a, a prerequisite to having a good job and being a contributing member to society these days. And so I'll let you read the statistics here, but I want you to ask as you're reading this, what do you think the odds are that the world will build four major universities that serve 30,000 students each to open every week for the next 15 years? Is that in the budgets of Scotland right now? Uh, from what I've heard this morning, I think not. And so that, uh, that calls upon us to think in new ways about how we, uh, how we dedicate our educational investments. So the good news is this is not some crazy dream, uh, not something I cooked up on my way up from Bath last night on the easy jet, uh, but this is actually a decade long uh, plus conversation that folks have been having about if, if educational resources are digital, if we can truly share them at the marginal cost of zero, um, and if we've got the licensing structure to do it, what's possible? And so uh, my boss at Creative Commons, her name is uh, Catherine Casserly. Uh, when Kathy was at the Hewlett Foundation as a program officer, she did a lot of the early investments in open educational resources. So Kathy and her colleagues funded MIT to go open, Carnegie Mellon to go open, they funded the Open University, uh, their Open Learn project to get started, and many, many other projects around the world. And this is a quote from Kathy in 2006. She said, quote, at the heart of the movement toward open educational resources is the simple and powerful idea that the world's knowledge is a public good and that technology in general and the web in particular provide an opportunity for everyone to share, use, and reuse it, end quote. The very next year, there was a meeting in Cape Town, uh, South Africa that was hosted by, uh, by Desmond Tutu. And out of it came the Cape Town Declaration, which is a, uh, a really excellent document. I recommend reading it if you've not seen it. It's short. The first sentence of the Cape Town Declaration says, we are on the cusp of a global revolution in teaching and learning. Educators worldwide <clears throat> are developing a vast pool of educational resources on the internet, open and free for all to use. These educators are creating a world where each and every person on earth can access and contribute to the sum of all human knowledge. So again, amplifying this idea. UNESCO actually coined the term open educational resources at a meeting in 2002. And what, but what's more important is last year there was a big meeting, some of you were there, uh, in Paris called the, uh, the Paris, or what came out of it is called the Paris OER Declaration. It was a big OER conference. There were 195 countries from around the world and there was unanimous consent around the Paris OER Declaration. And it said many things about, and, and in your, um, I think in the uh, openness handout that was provided for this conference, you'll see the main uh, points. It's uh, A through H. Uh, but it said things like uh, support open educational resources, support resource around it, support uh, innovative faculty who want to step forward and do this. Uh, but it also said point H, uh, which I'll harp on a bit today, uh, that governments should actually adopt open policies. And an open policy is very simple. It says publicly funded resources should be openly licensed resources. Even better, publicly funded resources should go straight into the public domain, uh, which is even more free and gives you more access than under an open license. Um, and governments were having serious conversations about this. So, so what are we talking about here with, with open licensing? I think we, we all intuitively understand the affordances of digital things. We understand when we've got a digital textbook that yes, the production costs are high, and yes, the maintenance costs are also high. But if we do that once, and we've got that digital object, we can actually share it with everybody at the marginal cost of zero. We, we get that. What was a bit of a challenge a decade ago is we had two choices in most countries around the world. You had public domain, and I don't, I, I'm not familiar with the laws in uh, Scotland about how something gets in the public domain. Can anybody tell me? Yeah. <laughs> Same in the US. It's a rather unfortunate uh, set of circumstances to get your work into the public domain. Uh, in the United States, first you have to die. Uh, and then after you're dead, you have to wait 70 years, all right? Well, not you, because you're gone, but the rest of the society has to wait 70 years. And then your work goes into the public domain. Um, so that was option A for sharing your resources. And option B was, uh, was all rights reserved uh, copyright, where no one could use your your work because it was all rights reserved. You held all the rights. There's nothing wrong with copyright. It's just that 10 years ago or so when the internet 
uh, allowed us all to share knowledge and information that's in education, culture, data, government data, all sorts of uh, information. Uh, and our intention was to share. What we had was all rights reserved, assuming we were living. And so what you had to do if you wanted to share is you had to have a lawyer. And your lawyer had to talk with somebody else's lawyer and you had to write a contract that said, here's our agreement to share these resources at no cost and these are the rights that I give you. Well, most, most people in education, most faculty and teachers don't have their own personal attorneys, believe it or not. Uh, and even if they could, they probably couldn't afford them. Uh, and so uh, this was a problem, right? There was nothing in between these extremes. So a bunch of lawyers from around the world got together and said, you know, this is not a difficult problem. What we need are simple, free, open copyright licenses that anybody on the planet can add to their all rights reserved work. So the, the sort of the genius of Creative Commons a decade ago was it said, we're not gonna try to replace copyright. We're not going to try to uh, usurp that regime, although there were several that said that that's exactly what should be done. Rather, Creative Commons respects copyright, says keep your ownership, keep your intellectual property. You, the author, you should not give that up. And if you wanna share, you can add an open license to your work. So when people do this, and so this is the basic idea of Creative Commons, simple standardized way to grant copyright permissions to your work. You don't need a lawyer, it's free, it's simple. That's the idea. By the way, um, a colleague from Open Source Software here, we're having a conversation. All these ideas are not new ideas. Uh, these were ideas that were really developed by the uh, Open Source Software community uh, for many, many years before Creative Commons existed. And all of the principles and ideas about sharing really come from, from software. All, all that Creative Commons did was said, we're gonna take those ideas and we're gonna enable you to apply them to creative works which are under copyright. So when people choose a license, um, you, you have choice. All of our licenses require attribution, which means if you use my textbook, you use my course, whatever it is, you must give me attribution, you must give me credit. And that's, we understand that in the academy, right? You use somebody's work, you, you cite them, you give them credit. The other three are options. Share Alike essentially says, if you take my work and you make a derivative work, you make an adaptation, you make a big change to it, that that new work that you produce must be licensed under the same terms. So this is what Wikipedia uses. They use attribution share alike. Non-commercial says what you would think. It says you can take my work, you can distribute it, you can perform it, you can use it for free, you can make changes to it, but you may not sell it. You can't put it on the web and sell it for 1995. No derivatives says you can take my work, but you can't change it, okay, you can't make any modifications. In education, we tend to stay away from this one. In fact, the no derivatives uh, clause violates open educational resources definitions because of course educators change stuff, right? They take a little bit from here and a little bit from there and they mix it up and they change it and they modify it to meet the needs of their learners and to meet the needs of, uh, of the business community that they're sending their students into. So when you mix and match those different conditions, you get one of these six open copyright licenses. Uh, and again, these are free, they don't cost anything. I should say right up front, people always say, you know, what's the angle, what are you trying to sell? How are you funded? Is this some corporate scheme? Uh, Creative Commons is a very small organization, uh, about 25 uh, people at headquarters, uh, and then we've got teams around uh, the world. We're funded mostly by foundations who simply are glad that we exist because we make it easy to share on the web. So we're not selling anything, just to be clear. <clears throat> if you look at our licenses on a continuum, uh, when I say least free to most free, we're not talking about cost. There is no cost to use the licenses. We're talking about degrees of freedom that you're extending to other people. So uh, if something's in the public domain, people can use it to do anything they want with it. They don't even have to give you attribution. They don't have to give you credit. Creative Commons attribution or CC BY, so the BY is like a byline. This book is by uh, Lorna Campbell. Right? That's, that's what BY is. And then BY essay, et cetera. So as you go, kind of go down this, the licenses get uh, more restrictive. Not to say that, that, that one is better than the other. We have six licenses because different people uh, need different restrictions on their work for different reasons. Uh, and so we maintain all six licenses. Uh, but more often than not in education, we try to stay toward the, the top of that continuum. And here's why. Uh, if, you, uh, if you line up the licenses and ask, what can you remix together? So one of the benefits in education of materials that are openly licensed 
is that you can take something from MIT OpenCourseWare and something from the Open University and something from uh, University of Glasgow that all have open licenses on them and you can mix them together and create something new. Uh, and that's a benefit. And you can see where there's a green check, you're allowed to remix different license works and where there's an X, you're not. And so to be up toward, uh, up toward these gives you more degrees of freedom. One of the reasons why uh, people around the world use uh, o open licensing and Creative Commons in particular is not only do we have uh, teams of lawyers around the world that make sure the licenses work in every uh, country and every le legal jurisdiction on the planet, uh, but our licenses also come in uh, three layers. So you would imagine a, a legal document would have legal code. It would be a big, long, any lawyers in here? No? Good. Let's talk about lawyers. <clears throat> Anybody have any good lawyer jokes? So uh, it's a, you know, it's a 20-page document and it's what you would expect. It's about a, a bunch of legal jargon that you would take to court if anybody ever violated your, your copyright. And that's good to have because it's, you feel good about your rights being protected. Uh, but most of us don't read that and really, frankly, don't want to read that. And so most people read this, what we, which we call the human readable deed, which is, I think, kind of funny. It's like lawyers aren't human or something. So we have this human readable deed for the rest of us and it's written at a grade six level. Uh, at the bottom of the deed, you can see a variety of different languages that you can quickly translate the license into. And the idea here is to make these licenses accessible to everybody. So if I'm a teenager uh, in the Czech Republic and I'm looking at this MIT course and I want to know what rights I have to modify it, to use it, uh, to, to share it forward, uh, that should be accessible to everybody and not just somebody with a legal degree. So that's the human readable deed and this is what most people see on the web. And then any tech folks in the room, I know there are several, appreciate that the licenses are also machine readable. So there's actually machine code in the licenses that tools on the web can read. So for example, if you go to Google's advanced search and you search for algebra textbook or whatever, um, you can actually filter your search results at the bottom of the screen by usage rights. And what, the, what Google's searching against are Creative Commons licenses on the web. Uh, we try to make this very simple, even though this is, uh, this is our license chooser, it is pretty simple. Most of us still think it's too complicated and we've actually just uh, stolen the pro top product development guy from Mozilla uh, to redesign all of the tools around uh, Creative Commons technologies to make it even easier for people to use. Our goal is to have this be a one-click thing. I'm going to add my license, add the license to my work. Uh, but nevertheless, if you go to our homepage and click on get a license, you answer two questions, it tells you what the license is, you put in any metadata about it, what's the title of your work, who should get attribution, and then you copy the code, you drop it in your web page and you're done. If, if it's a, if it's a uh, different work like a Word document or a PDF or something, you can change the format and apply the license. Most people though actually don't get licenses from our website, they get them on the web on different platforms. So people that upload images to Flickr, Flickr allows you to add a Creative Commons license to your work. People who upload videos to YouTube, we've all heard of YouTube, yeah? Uh, you can choose a, a Creative Commons attribution license and put it on your YouTube video. And this is growing so fast that my, my stats are out of date, but I think there's something like 40 or 50 years of CC BY licensed video now on YouTube that you can remix and YouTube actually gives you a remix video tool so you can leverage that. So there are just a few items out there on the web. Uh, this number is probably low by half. Our, our data analytics are frankly lousy and that's something else that we're working on right now. Not just for us to know how much is out there, uh, but what's important is we want to enable you to know how much uh, of your work is being used and by whom and what the derivatives are. So our goal is to give every licensor or every author who has licensed their works with open licenses to actually have a nice little dashboard where they can say, I'm a faculty at the University of Glasgow and I've shared my textbook under an open license. How many people have used it? How many uh, different translations ha have there been of my book? How many classrooms around the world are taking advantage of this? Has my book forked? Are there different versions of my book out there? And so we're working on, on that right now. <clears throat> this is not some, uh, some US centric thing. In fact, we've got teams in 74 uh, countries around the world and you'll see that there's actually a, uh, a Scottish affiliate. Um, these are teams of lawyers, educators, sometimes people from government, uh, people from uh, culture. So there's musicians, artists, 
who uh, all share this, this basic idea that they want to share what they produce, and they want to help other people learn about that as well. And so um, these are fairly eclectic teams. Some of them are small, two, three people. Uh, some of them are very large, um, 15 or so, like the team in Australia. Uh, and it depends on, on which country we're adding more all the time. I think Mongolia was just added a few weeks ago. Uh, Creative Commons as, an organiz as a global organization works across uh, several areas. Education is the, the unit that I lead, uh, but also we work in uh, science and data. Uh, somebody from OKFN here? No. But uh, Open Knowledge Foundation, I think many of you know, uh, we work very closely with them on science and data. Uh, government and philo uh, philanthropy, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, culture, which is really where Creative Commons came from, came out of the uh, artists and musicians uh, and photographers who wanted to share their work online. And GLAM, GLAM is galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. So this was something that I had no idea about when I came to Creative Commons two years ago. Uh, but libraries are actually wanting to share their works online and the metadata about their works um, online. Uh, and museums, as you might expect, they have this mission to share uh, their works with the world. Uh, and then uh, media and platforms. We talked about how we integrate with platforms. Uh, there are several big adoptions out there. Wikipedia obviously has just a few materials online. Uh, Flickr, there's something like 175 million CC licensed images. Uh, and then, of course, higher education, which is where we work. Um, the Open University has an amazing site called OpenLearn, where currently they take about 5% of all their content and put it under a Creative Commons license and they share it with the world. And this has, this has real impacts. Um, Lorna mentioned when I was with the community colleges in the state of Washington, uh, we built something uh, called the Open Course Library, which was the entire general education curriculum, and we put it under a Creative Commons attribution license. Anything that we built was under a CC BY license. But we took, before we built anything, we looked around the world at, at other projects that were willing to share with us, because why in the world would we recreate the wheel? Right? We, we revised and took, so we took from MIT OpenCourseWare, which they've got their 2,600 courses online, all openly licensed. We took from the Open University, and we translated uh, some things so that it was appropriate for a community college and technical students, because an MIT physics course or an Open University physics course was a little bit too high of a level, so we, we modified it. But we didn't start from zero. So the... Um, this organization, the Open Courseware Consortium, was mentioned. Uh, this is also uh, 10 years old. This is uh, really all the universities around the world who have this idea of sharing and are openly licensing their content. Um, they get together annually and, and share more. This is also happening in primary and secondary uh, schools. Uh, in the United States, we call it K-12, kindergarten to 12. Uh, big OER projects um, all over the world, uh, one of them nearby in Poland, uh, where uh, we've got a very strong team in Warsaw, and they help the government understand that not all Polish uh, primary school students had access to textbooks because the parents uh, have to buy the books, and the net result of that is that roughly half of the kids didn't have books. And uh, the government looked at that and said, you know what, that's unacceptable. How can you learn if you don't have the learning resources that you need? And so for a, a, uh, about 14 million uh, U.S. a year, I don't know what that translates to in, in Polish currency. I'd have to look. Uh, but for, you know, for, for a national government, that's a very modest investment. Um, they're actually putting out RFPs, so anyone can, can build these books, including the uh, commercial textbook publishing industry. Uh, but the condition is, is that on all the books, there will be a Creative Commons attribution license. And so the different school districts in Poland, if they want to make modifications, they've got the legal right to do so. It's all in Polish, it meets the national standards. Now all the kids can have books, right? It was a relatively simple solution. So we don't have time today, but there are literally hundreds of open educational resource projects uh, around the world. We've thrown this <coughs> term around a bit, but what does it mean? This is the definition that the Hewlett Foundation uses that most uh, project key off of. So the UNESCO definition, the OECD, others use very similar definitions. And I'll let you read it, but what's really important is that for something to be OER, it must have two uh, characteristics. One is that it must be free, at, meaning no cost. It must be gratis, or as the open source software community likes to say, uh, free as in free beer. Uh, but it also 
must, you must have the legal rights to repurpose the resource. Um, so you must be able to change it. In the OER space, we say you must have the legal rights to do the four R's. And the four R's are the, the rights to reuse. So I can take your thing and just use it as it is. I must be able to revise it. So I must be able to change it and make it my own so that it meets my needs. I must be able to remix it. So take some of your work and some of your work and some of mine and mush it together and create something new. And I must be able to redistribute that new thing that I've created or, or the thing I took from you, I must be able to share it with everyone else. And if I don't have the legal rights, the legal rights to do those four things, it's not an open educational resource. So we've talked a little bit about MOOCs uh, you know, today. Uh, most MOOCs out there are not truly open. They're not OER. Uh, the good news is the Europeans are starting to uh, show the world how to do that properly. So there's uh, the, uh, what is it, o Open Ed Up or Open Up? Opening up education, and there's a series of MOOCs around that, uh, not just in, in uh, Europe, but uh, they've, got, they've got Israel now, and, and Russia, and several other countries. Uh, and they're actually starting with the idea that MOOCs should actually be openly licensed, and they're making that a, a bit of a precondition to join. So um, th this is spreading, right? It's, uh, what's interesting is that funders are now starting to say, we like these ideas, and in fact, uh, purely from a Funders' perspective, one of the things that funders, governments, foundations, other people that have money that want things done, uh, they want to see impact for their investments and they want to see a return on investment. They want the highest uh, efficiency that they can possibly get for the dollar invested. And I know that, that those are discussions that are happening here. I was watching it on the news last night. Uh, you've got less money and you're trying to figure out how to be more efficient with the dollars uh, that you're spending or I should say the pounds that you're spending. Um, and, and foundations are no different. We'll get to governments in a moment. Uh, so the punchline on foundations is that they're starting to require that if you take their money, you put an open license on what you build. You don't like those terms, don't apply for the grant. Right, it's that simple. So some of the benefits of OER, uh, search and discovery, so be able to filter on the web and, and have tools that can actually see OER is helpful. Uh, the, here's what the legal rights give you. And let's be very clear, if I, uh, t everybody knows Coursera, the, the MOOC, right? So universities, big universities are giving Coursera content. If you and I work at uh, the University of Edinburgh and this afternoon we say, wow, look at that really great Coursera course. Let's take that or take parts of it and use it in our course for our lectures tomorrow. Uh, if there's no open license on it, if it's all rights reserved, we just violated their copyright. Uh, we are subject to prosecution under U.S. copyright law because it's a U.S. organization, and we could be sued under international uh, copyright treaties. I mean, it's, it's serious business. Uh, if it has an open license on it, the, the, the story would be we don't even ask, need to ask permission. The permissions are given to us in advance because there's an open license on it, and as long as we comply with the terms of the license, which it would depend on which Creative Commons license it is, we can just take it and we can use it tomorrow. That's the difference, right? So it really is uh, meaningful. Some of the things that the legal rights get you is the ability to make a translation. So we're talking about the Polish uh, uh, K-12 books. If you wanted to use those here in Scotland, uh, that them being in Polish probably isn't useful to you and your students, but you could translate them uh, into whatever language you wanted. Uh, making books accessible is also critical. Do you have national accessibility laws here, right? About every, it doesn't matter what disability somebody might have, you must provide the educational resources in a way that meets their needs. Um, I don't know about your universities, but universities where I'm from uh, do a very lousy job at that for the most part, and we tend to retrofit courses only when students come to those classes. Uh, so if there's an open license on something, uh, if you didn't do a good enough job, somebody else can fix it, and they don't need to ask your permission before they modify your course to make it accessible. These are probably the two most important aspects, though, of OER. <clears throat> if you can't customize materials in the 21st century and you're a teacher, you're working with the wrong material. So I, I, I live in Washington State uh, in the Northwest. Uh, in, in my state, uh, are, and I'm a little upset about this because I have two young boys. They're eight and five years old. They're in the public schools. The books uh, that the government provides to my boys are on average 10 years old, uh, including their political science books and their 
uh, so, you know, Pluto is still a planet, and all this garbage and outdated information, and the books are only available in paper. And I, I talk to the teachers in the schools uh, where my kids go to school, and I say, you know, how do you feel about that? And they're very upset, right, because they know better, and what they'd really like to do is modify those resources or use other resources, but they're required to use these outdated uh, materials. And my boys are actually afraid to use their learning resources because they're paper. Uh, we have to sign something that says if my kid loses the book, I have to pay for the book. And my sons know that $150 is a lot of money. And so the net result of that is they refuse to take their books back and forth to school because they're afraid to lose the books because they don't want me to pay. I mean, what kind of system is this? Right? This is nuts. And so the, uh, the ability for... Uh, for faculty and teachers to be able to do that is critical. Affordability, obviously important as well. Um, I, I, anybody know how much textbooks cost on average for higher ed in Scotland? A year? In the U.S., it's about roughly a thousand U.S. dollars. You said it should be less than that. Yep. And also, and also can we say it's a matter of the textbooks tend to be not quite so important here in the U.S. Okay. Well, that's good. That's a good thing. <laughs> so the United States, especially in the community and technical colleges, which is about one half of the population of higher education, uh, the cost of textbooks can be 25 to 50 percent of the cost of going to college or to university. So it's, it's, uh, it's very high. So to the extent that uh, open educational resources have a cost of zero, uh, that's meaningful. And it allows people to get to their degree faster. It allows them to get that job faster. It allows them to get back into the economy quicker than they might have otherwise. <coughs> so, uh, so that's all nice and sweet, and wouldn't it be you know, wonderful if we had world peace? But is this really going to happen? And how, what are the arguments uh, with governments specifically about how to do this? <coughs> so with governments, it really comes down to this. Um, they need to understand that uh, most of our systems in education are built on this concept of rivalrous resources. If I have something, I have it and you don't, right? And we, th our systems are built that way, which makes a lot of sense because uh, resources, uh, a lot of resources are rivalrous and, and it is a zero sum game, uh, but digital resources are not. And so to the extent that what we're using for resources are digital and they can be shared at the marginal cost of zero, uh, we need to think about that. So a couple uh, quick models. I don't know if you can see this, but slides will be available. We actually, uh, we, we, we made this up for a, uh, a government recently who needed to understand the current structure of academic research and what open access research looks like, and the current structure of funding educational resources, and then what open educational resources looks like. So this first is how research tends to work in most governments around the world. So, Government announces, announces an RFP, you want to uh, fund the research on pancreatic cancer. Right? So you announce an RFP, uh, scholars uh, then get that grant, they do the research, they write the papers, they submit to the articles, uh, they submit to journals. On submission, they must turn their copyright over to the journal. So now the author no longer owns it, the public owns nothing, and the professor who wrote the article owns nothing. The journals then publish mainly in closed access journals. Your libraries have to subscribe to those journals, again, using public funds. Now that public's paid for it, not twice, but how many universities are there in Scotland? 24? Okay, so now the government's paid another 24 times. And if there's multiple libraries on the same campus, maybe more than that, the public is granted little or no reuse rights to those articles because if you're not a student or a faculty member at those universities, you don't have access to that research. And the net result is slow scientific progress. Why? Well, because if you can't afford a fifteen or $20,000 a year journal, you're out of luck. You can't read the research. That's the model today. This is the new model around open access. Governments are putting out money, putting out RFPs for pancreatic research, but they're saying there's an open license requirement in the money. So if you take this money, uh, after an embargo period, you will share what you build. So then science, all the same stuff happens. Scientific research happens, they submit, they tell the, the journals upon submission, look, I, I, my hands are tied. <clears throat> I've got this requirement, I have to share what I write. 
So it goes into the traditional journals under an embargo period, meaning the public doesn't get access for six months or 12 months, something like that. It's a negotiated time period. But then after that, the public can download the articles from an open access repository. And in many cases, full reuse rights are granted, meaning there's a, a Creative Commons license on the articles. And what does that result in? Well, a lot more people, in fact, anybody in the world can get access to that research now. And, uh, and in fact, science moves faster, big surprise. Uh, there was a, a case in the United States recently, a high school kid, anybody see this? It was actually a pancreatic cancer research. Anybody see this thing? So this high school kid, he's in class, his teacher gives him an assignment. The assignment is find a medical test and improve it. I mean, what kind of assignment is that for a high school kid, right? This kid is in biology class, he says, okay. So he picks pancreatic cancer because I think somebody in his family had had it, a personal issue for him. So he looks and the current test in the US is, takes something like three days, the blood test costs $500. Seems reasonable to me, right? That's not long to wait for a test. Kid says, too long, costs too much. So he goes and he does research. He keeps hitting these paywalls, can't get access to the articles. Goes to his, his library at the high school, they've got nothing. Goes to the university library, oh, sorry, government has trimmed our budget, we've had to cut journals. So he couldn't get access to the journals, so he ended up doing all of his research, or most of it, in open access journals, where he could get access to this. And that result, the punchline on this, is the kid redesigns the medical test, so now it doesn't take three days, it takes five minutes. It doesn't cost $500, it costs three cents. Right? It's a factor of something like 20,000 percent cheaper and much faster. And you don't have to pull blood anymore. You can take a Q-tip and swab the inside of your mouth and use the DNA to do the test. And his test is 99.999 percent effective, which is a higher rate of effectiveness. Right? So, the, so, so the point here is what, what might be accomplished if you start to make information, make research, make knowledge available? We don't know because we've never done it before, right? But the fact of the matter is there's roughly 5% of the world's population that's got access to high quality education, higher education today. And there's a whole lot more people that want to come in that aren't able to get in because of the way that we structure it. <clears throat> Similarly, here's what it looks like for education. Two minutes, oh boy. Okay, we'll skip that. <laughs> so these are the arguments for government, right? We say, look, government, here's how much this is what textbooks look like. If you took a 250-page textbook, um, you would you'd copy by hand, you could do print on demand, but here's how much it costs to copy by computer, 0. 0.00084 cents. Here's what distribution costs look like. Right, so for all intents and purposes, copying and distribution is free. Here's what properly disrupted markets look like. So here's movie, television, songs, et cetera. This is what you can get today for about eight US dollars a month. Here's what music looks like. Anybody subscribe to Spotify or any of these services, right? I mean, it's amazing. 15 million songs for, you know, $10 a month, and it's free if you're on your desktop. It's just if you want them on your mobile phone, you pay the 10 bucks a month. So why would you even pay 99 cents a song anymore? I mean, you basically get access to all of the music in the world for $10 a month. It's not a bad deal. Here's, here's, so here's the comparison, right? For $20 a month, you can kind of get access to all the movies and all the television, or you can lease one textbook uh, from a commercial textbook company. Now, which markets have been properly disrupted by the fact that their services and their products are digital? Right, so governments are starting to ask, and educators are starting to ask, when the marginal cost of sharing these resources is digital, what should we do with that capability? Because clearly, this isn't doing it. Okay, so. And then, and then uh, frankly, this, I ask three questions when I sit down with governments. Uh, and I tend to get answers yes to all three. Right? Do, are you interested in efficient use of dollars, saving students money, increasing access? So this is happening. California just put out five million to build 50 CC by licensed open textbooks. British Columbia saw that and said, that's a good idea. They put down another uh, uh, money for another 60. The US Department of Labor put out two billion US dollars two years ago for US community colleges to build next generation programs in green technologies, advanced manufacturing, allied health. Guess what? They put a Creative Commons attribution license requirement in the grant. It says this, it says if you take the money, whatever you build or revise with public money, you will share it. You don't like those terms? Don't apply for the grant. You think anybody didn't apply for a $20 million grant? They all took the money and they said we're happy to share. 
So just uh, to wrap up, a um, couple more points. Uh, this also, the White House just on the uh, open access and academic research, just told its 23 largest agencies, NIH, National Science Foundation, NASA, Department of Education, said from now on, we're not doing that old academic research model. From now on, if people take public money after a 12-month embargo period, they'll have free access to it. This is what all these things are talking about, that publicly funded resources should be openly licensed. Let me just get to a final slide here, since I'm out of time. So maybe my favorite Churchill quote to close it up. <clears throat> so Churchill uh, said, if you have knowledge, light, uh, let others light their candles with it. Right? And what he's getting at here is that if I share my knowledge with you, it actually does no harm to me. In fact, uh, we are both better off for it. It's a non-rivalrous resource. Knowledge is what we peddle in higher education. And given that it's digital now, and we can share things at the marginal cost of zero with open licensing, we should do so. And this is what's important to keep in mind. And frankly, this is uh, where we need to stiffen our backbones because the fight against these ideas is significant from existing business models which don't like these conversations. So the open access model is being fought strongly right now by a big company called Elsevier, which is right across uh, the ocean here in, in the Netherlands that owns a big chunk of the academic journals. And why are they fighting? Well, because they're a multi-billion dollar industry that makes 46% profit, I'm sorry, 36% profit margins on their income. There's no other business on the planet that makes 36% profit margins. Why do they? Well, because you, the governments, are paying for all this. They pay for nothing. They get all the copyright, and then they sell it back to you 26 times. I mean, it's a great business model if you can get it. Uh, is it a good deal for us? No. And so this is what we need to do, but what we also need to keep in mind is we have to hold all existing business models as secondary priorities to our goals of being efficient with public monies and with foundation monies. Because if we're not leveraging the tools of the day, uh, then that's, that's our fault. If we've got students that can't afford and can't get into education, it's only because we're not leveraging the tools, the technical tools and the legal tools that we can. So uh, my organization uh, stands with you if you like these ideas. And a final thought for the 21st century, the opposite of open is no longer closed. The opposite of open is broken. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Cable. I think there's a, a lot to think about there. We've got a few minutes for questions before we move on to some lightning presentations um, from some of our colleagues on the other aspects of the so, Any questions for Cable from the floor? You just skipped over, so I'm particularly interested in the amount of time, but it was, you're talking about what is given away for free, fully by now, and you talk about traditional models. How do universities make money? How do we retain what we do sell? I mean, there are other aspects of accreditation, student support, which are above and beyond materials. The materials are absolutely free. How do we find that sweet spot between um, the closed system we have now, the way we fund it, and an open system that still funds that um, support and accreditation? Yeah, so I was asked to repeat the question so people online can hear. Um, I'll summarize if that's okay. Uh, so uh, given, given these trends, uh, and if universities fully engage in these ideas, uh, how do they, what's the economic model? How do they still make money? And I would extend your question to say, uh, if universities get involved in MOOCs and you know, online learning at a mass scale, uh, will people still come? Will they still pay tuition? Uh, what does this mean for universities? Uh, so I, I think there are several <laughs> answers to that. Um, what, one answer is, uh, se well, several of you are probably familiar with Clayton Christensen's disruptive innovations theory, right? And disruptive innovation, so Christensen, if you don't know him, is a Harvard business scholar. And basically what he says is, if your business or service um, you know, goes digital especially, what happens is that um, new entrants to the market can come in relatively easily because the costs or the barriers to joining that market are lower. Um, than they ever have been. So think about you know, newspapers today. If you wanted to start a newspaper 20 years ago, you'd better have several hundred million pounds in your back pocket. Today, if you want to start a blog, you can be up and running in five minutes. Not the same thing, but anyone can start to contribute. Right? So I think part of the answer to your question is 
universities today don't really sell content, right? What universities sell is access to great faculty, they sell student services, they sell um, an experience of getting away from home and joining a new community, um, they sell um, access to colleagues that you're going to be peers with in your professional career, um, they sell you know, finding your mate, they sell all sorts of things. <laughs> Um, and I think a lot of people will still pay for those experiences. So I think it's, uh, it's erroneous to say that students are paying for access to content. If that were true, why does anybody go to MIT anymore? MIT has been giving away their content for a decade. Uh, when MIT said they were going to give away their content, everybody said, you're nuts. Nobody will go to MIT anymore. And big surprise, their admissions have only gone up. Um, and I, I don't know of any university that's opened up its content that's seen a decline uh, in admissions, right? People go for different reasons. So I think universities don't have much to fear about open educational resources. I also don't think, and, and open access is just a huge win on academic research. If you're a scholar, a university, to get access to knowledge faster and less, and less expensive and, and remove the middlemen and the inefficient processes, that's only a good thing. I think what universities have to fear most is that they have not been disrupted yet by digital technologies. We've not yet seen online learning in particular uh, seriously disrupt higher education. I think it's coming. I don't know when. I think MOOCs are a bit of a kick to get us to think about that. Uh, but again, my boys are eight and five. Um, I have no idea what their options for college are going to look like. I expect that what they're going to be able to do is to take some of their courses in something like a MOOC and get credit for it very easily because pathways are already being created from non-traditional sources like MOOCs or other learning experiences into traditional accreditation. Um, I was with Mozilla yesterday. We were talking about open badges and when we were in Bath. Uh, Mozilla is actually you know, talking directly to Fortune 500 companies and other big uh, multinationals and saying, what, what skills and competencies do you need in your employees? What do you want? Including good writing skills and diplomatic skills, the ability to work with international teams, and so not just tactical skills. Um, and they're backing those skills and competencies into badges. So was anybody in the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or anything like that, right? We had badge sashes. If you think about badges, they were discrete information <clears throat> about what you knew and what you could do. And you had to perform those tasks, right? I have to do. I have to put Band-Aids and put a tourniquet on you before I get my emergency preparedness badge, right? So if you, if you think about that, that's much more information and, and better discrete information about what somebody can do, as opposed to walking into my office and you can see all my pretty degrees that are on my wall, but they don't tell you anything about what I can do. And in fact, if you called Ohio State University and says, so what can Cable Green do? We're thinking of hiring him. There's not a single thing that Ohio State could tell you about me. And so we have a really lousy way. I mean, degrees, think about a degree, a piece of paper. That's used as a proxy to tell businesses whether or not they should hire somebody. It's a terrible system. So I think that these, these bad systems are going to be replaced and disrupted. We just don't know how yet.